Hello, my name is Manesh Patel, and I'm here on behalf of the American Heart Association Scientific News, AHA Scientific News at ESC, where we're talking to Holger Thiel, who's an investigator well-known to many uh, in Germany and an interventional cardiologist who's presenting the ECMO shock trial, another great shock trial from Holger and the team. Holger, will you tell us a little bit about the background for this shock study? Yeah, um, so as you may can remember, it's now more than 10 years ago that we published our so-called IBP shock 2 trial. Um, this for 600 patients <clears throat> randomized to intraortic balloon pump versus control and inpatient with acute myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock. And this trial showed that there is no mortality benefit with the enteriotic balloon pump. And based on this, we now, at least in the European guidelines, have a class 3B recommendation to not use the enteriotic balloon pump anymore. So a reflex in what we have been doing in Germany, in France, and many other countries in Europe, probably the same in the United States, that we stopped using the intuitive bloom pump, but we jumped over to active mechanical circulatory support like VA ECMO, which is also called extracorporeal life support, or also impeller. The problem with that is that we also have no randomized or no hard randomized evidence from VA ECMO. Currently, we also do not have hard evidence for the impeller. And <clears throat> that's the reason why we decided to do a large-scale randomized trial of VA ECMO, which is also called Extracorporal Life Support. That's the reason why the, the acronym of our trial is ECL Shock, um, in comparison to control in patients with acute myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock. Yeah, critical. Thank you so much for setting us up and telling us about the ECLS uh, Shock trial. And maybe tell us how many patients you randomized and what did the patients look like? Yeah, so our sample size calculation was based on the available evidence at this time when we started or when we planned the trial. So based on this, there was a meta-analysis of observational data showing a, a relative, no, an absolute reduction of 33% for patients being on ECMO in comparison to control with a wide confidence interval. And the lower confidence interval was 14%. And that's the reason why we, we try to be conservative. And that's the reason why we decided to go for a 14% mortality reduction. We assumed that mortality would be 49% in the control group and having a 14% reduction. And this led us to altogether 420 patients to be randomized in this randomized um, controlled clinical trial. That's wonderful. So patients with acute MI coming in in cardiogenic shock, getting randomized to one of two strategies, routine revascularization as fast as possible. Uh, and then the other strategy was to put in VA ECMO and then revascularize. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Plus revascularization. And this plus, is also plus optimal medical therapy. Of course, that's right. Of course, is not well defined. Um, so we usually give Inotropes, we usually give vasopressive if this is required, and this is general intensive care medicines. What we do, um, this is what we call optimal medical therapy. We had a very complicated space where we are taking care of very sick patients uh, around the world. Um, and so, describe the patients for us. You know, I saw when I was reviewing it with you, uh, you know, that uh, a significant number of them had um, serum lactate that you had checked, and you had to have a serum lactate above a, a certain level. Uh, tell yeah. us about that that inclusion criterion and a little bit about the patients. I think this is very important for the interpretation also of the results. So the inclusion criteria were very similar to corporate shocks. They were also very similar to IVP shock 2. The only difference was that we had an obligatory lactate of more than 3 millimoles per liter, which is higher than in the previous trials. Um, the reason for this is we tried to have more advanced cardiogenic shock in our randomized trial because we thought about um, <clears throat> also possible harm of the device and to not enroll so-called intermediate to low-risk cardiogenic shock patients. That's the reason why we decided to increase the lactate level and based on all our, our randomized um, clinical trial data and also the registries um, from IBP shock 2 from corporate shock we projected a 49% mortality for those patients having a lactate of more than three 
So we try to enrich the risk of the patients. This is why we had the lactate of more than three. This is what you mentioned regarding the baseline characteristics. The median lactate level in both groups was a little bit more than six, which is higher in comparison to IBP shock two, which is also higher in comparison to corporate shock. Um, this clearly shows us that we um, included a more risk or a higher risk population in comparison to previous randomized trials. Yeah, I think it's fair, a, a way to think about the risk benefit of putting in a mechanical device is certainly one like VA ECMO, you might want higher risk patients. So tell us what you found. Yeah, so we exactly found the 49% mortality in the control group as this is probably also important as projected in our sample size calculation. Now, the BAT, um, the mortality in the ECMO or ECLS group was 47.8%. So, <clears throat> absolutely, there was a 2.2% um, mortality um, lower uh, or lower mortality, but this was not statistically significant. As this was absolutely neutral regarding mortality between VA ECMO in comparison to control. And how about some of the other possible complications from uh, um, uh, ECMO, bleeding or vascular complications? How frequently was that? Happening? Yeah, so we had several safety endpoints which were predefined. So one was stroke. Um, there were no difference um, regarding stroke um, between the two groups, but there were significantly more um, limb ischemia complications in the VA ECMO group, although a huge rate or a large number of patients got um, <clears throat> anti-grade cannula to prevent limb ischemia, but nevertheless, so there was a more than <clears throat> two-fold increase in limb ischemia in the VA ECMO group in comparison to the control group. And there was a <clears throat> nearly four times higher risk of major bleeding according to the bar criteria in the VA ECMO group in comparison to, um, to control. Well, it's really valuable. And so uh, the take home is, uh, you know, instituting routine VA ECMO did not change outcomes for patients with cardiogenic shock and certainly severe cardiogenic shock with an elevated lactate. So what's yeah. next, Holger? What's next in this field? How do we move the field forward? This is a very good question. So if you ask me um, for the interpretation of the results of um, ECL shock, um, I think what we have done in the last 10 years uh, with a nearly 10 time increase of VA ECMO, probably even higher for Impeller, this was not the way to go. <clears throat> um, probably this is much overused um, based on evidence what we currently see. I'm not sure if there's any <clears throat> subgroup really having a benefit from active mechanical circulatory support. Um, we also published a, an individual patient data meta-analysis on all the four randomized trials of VA ECMO versus control, which um, came out in the Lancet. Um, <clears throat> and also there, there's no subgroup having a benefit from VA ECMO. Um, at least if there is a subgroup, currently we are not able to define a possible subgroup, the, probably the subgroup is extremely small. Um, I can't tell you the rate, maybe it's 1%, 2%. Um, and I also can I uh, can only speculate which group it may be. So maybe it's a very young patient who has an acute collapse where he has a rapid recovery by active mechanical circulatory support. But for all those patients, probably being longer in a so-called hemometabolic state of cardiogenic shock, maybe there's a point of no return. This is what we also have to discuss. Maybe <clears throat> our thinking of putting in a machine which is providing maybe two, three, four liter, liters of hemodynamic support, this is too simplistic. And on the other hand, this is what I personally believe what we have to think of probably, or maybe less is more. This is what we have learned from corporate shock. So putting in stents in all lesions is not beneficial. Probably it should go only for revascularization. Then <clears throat> what we currently observe or see is that radial excess in cardiogenic shock is still not often um, used. So currently maybe 20% 20, 20 of the patients undergo radial excess. Maybe this is what we have, have to think about. 
to prevent a so-called second hit, second hit bleeding, second hit inflammation. So this is what I personally believe. <clears throat> we have to think if there's a possibility to um, yeah, modulate inflammatory response. There are nice drugs which we um, we have. So these patients in cartilage and shocks, they have a huge increase in inflammation. So probably this is the way to go. This is probably the way we have to rethink. Putting in these machines is increasing inflammation. This is um, also something what we have to keep in mind. So maybe this is the next way to go. <clears throat> inflammation modulation, doing less, um, less is more. This is maybe the way to go. Well, thanks, Holger. This has been great, uh, great recap and important study added to the field. As you said, we've, you've helped, helped us think through balloon pumps, uh, now VA ECMO, and certainly culprit and non-culprit lesion revascularization in shock. Um, uh, so thank you again for uh, updating us and thank you for your work. And we appreciate the work you, the investigators, and certainly the patients that were in the study. Thank you. It was a pleasure.